We're going to talk about gas exchange in this video. First, let's talk about this functional unit of gas exchange in the lung, where your alveolus meets your pulmonary capillary network. This alveolus will have thin pulmonary epithelium. These are type 1 pneumocytes which are the thin pneumocytes. There are also type 2 pneumocytes um, that are found elsewhere, and they do things like produce surfactant, but the gas exchange will occur where you have these thin pulmonary epithelium. You'll have an interstitial space as well here in green. In this, there are various things like elastin, collagen, and interstitial fluid. In your interstitial fluid, you can have albumin and macrophages. These junctions between the capillary endothelial cells are actually large enough for macrophages to come out into this interstitial space. That can clean up and help infection if there's anything starting. This pulmonary capillary, which is made up of the capillary endothelium is just wide enough for blood cells to come through, so about 10 micrometers. On sort of this side of the drawing, we're coming from the pulmonary artery, or pulmonary arterioles, and then uh, leaving, this will go on to your pulmonary venules and your pulmonary vein and return to the heart with oxygenated blood. So let's go over what happens with carbon dioxide, um, which is brought to the alveolus in your blood. So we'll have a certain concentration of CO2 in the artery here. First, this will there will be some different venous concentration that'll be slightly higher, but this will equilibrate with our alveolar environment and we'll end up with a resulting pressure of CO2 inside the alveolus or P big A. CO2. This big A stands for alveolar, and the little a is arterial. And these will equilibrate to be virtually identical. So we'll say there's essentially no difference between your alveolar and your arterial CO2. This is thanks to very fast diffusion. So this diffusion is about 20 times faster than for O2. After you have an alveolar pressure of CO2, you can breathe this air out and have your CO2 leave the patient. So the ventilation of your alveoli, or the minute ventilation of your alveolus, alveolar minute vent, decreases your CO2 because you're accumulating your CO2 from your blood in the alveolus and then we breathe it out. Of course, you would accumulate CO2 then by holding your breath or you could remove CO2 rapidly by hyperventilating. Just for reference, normal PaCO2 is in the range of 40 millimeters of mercury. This is tightly regulated by areas of your brain that control respiratory drive, uh, basically to control the pH. So higher CO2 in the blood will cause the environment to be more acidic. Now for oxygen, you'll breathe in, and there will be some alveolar pressure of oxygen. That is your P big A, O2. And then unlike CO2, there is actually going to be a gradient between your alveolar pressure of oxygen, or the alve alveolar tension, and what we eventually end up with in the arterial circulation. So you'll have slightly less in the arterial blood than you did in your alveolus. And we refer to this as the PaO2 to P little a. O2 gradient or AA gradient. So this is going to be slightly higher 
and this is in part due to that slow or relatively slow diffusion. So whereas your CO2 was able to very quickly diffuse across these membranes, the oxygen has a slightly harder time diffusing past the, the membranes and your interstitial space. We worry about hypoxemia, which is when your SATs are less than 90%, and that corresponds to a PaO2 of less than 60 millimeters of mercury. There are lots of different causes of hypoxemia, but we can narrow our differential a little bit by determining if it's a normal AA gradient, meaning that the difference between your alveolar oxygen tension and your arterial oxygen tension is less than 15, or a high AA gradient hypoxemia. The low AA gradient would be caused by low FiO2, so breathing in low concentration of oxygen, or low global ventilation. For example, if your respiratory rate drops suddenly after giving a dose of opioids, and essentially the issue here is that your alveoli are not getting enough oxygen. In either of these cases, you'd be able to simply deliver a higher amount of oxygen to the alveoli and the blood would then willingly accept it and then you would solve the issue. When you have a high AA gradient, on the other hand, there is some type of barrier between effective delivery of alveolar oxygen to the pulmonary circulation through these uh, pulmonary capillaries. So things that can cause this are diffusion issues. So if you have a uh, largely increased interstitial space or something else that impairs diffusion, your oxygen will not be able to get into these pulmonary capillaries as easily and there will be a higher gradient. You could have an intrapulmonary shunt, so certain segments of your alveoli that are essentially not being ventilated but still have blood flow. Here you'll send your deoxygenated hemoglobin all the way through the lungs without picking up any new oxygen in the pulmonary veins. It will mix with the blood that did manage to pick up oxygen and your overall saturation will be lower. This is, of course, a shunt, but an intrapulmonary shunt. And there are also intracardiac shunts where we're sending our deoxygenated blood from the right, right heart straight on to the left side if you have a right to left shunt. So all of these things, if these are your issue, you cannot simply just turn up your oxygen delivery to the patient and expect the hypoxemia to resolve because there's some other issue going on that prevents effective um, delivery of oxygen to your final arterial blood. Just to finish up this diagram, this oxygen will be taken to your tissues and CO2 will be created as the byproduct of cellular respiration and then your CO2 is obviously brought back into your circulation. Next we'll go over the alveolar gas equation which we can use to determine if we have a normal AA gradient hypoxemia versus a high AA gradient hypoxemia because we can use this to calculate what our PaO2 is. Unfortunately, we cannot just measure this. Instead, uh, it can be calculated relatively easily. After we've calculated the PaO2, we just compare it against the um, P little AO2 that we get from an ABG and then uh, that will tell us what our AA gradient is.